Thank you very much. Today I have been asked to speak to you on the subject of sacred music. In his book, uh, the, uh, the History of Music in the Catholic Church, Fellerer divided music, sacred music, into three categories. Music that grew out of the liturgy, music that is written for the liturgy, and music that is played at the liturgy. According to Fellerer, the only repertoire of sacred music that actually grew out of the liturgy is Gregorian chant. It developed right along with the liturgy. It is at home with the liturgy. Even the highly esteemed sacred music of Palestrina falls into the second category of music written for the liturgy. With this in mind and due to our limited time, let us focus on the church's music, music that has developed over time with the liturgy itself, Gregorian chant. I will begin with a brief overview of the different genres of Gregorian chant, continuing with the church's official position on the use of Gregorian chant in today's liturgy, and ending with a basic instruction of chant notation and a rehearsal of the music for today's Mass. A lot to do in what looks like now maybe only a half hour. So we, have to, we may have to uh, skip some of this, but we'll see how it goes. I'm going to take my watch off so I can really watch the time. <clears throat> Let us begin by speaking of cantillation, a music of raised speech. As far back as a millennium before Christ, when the psalms were being written and chanted, the importance of a sacred music in worship was established. Indeed, evidence shows that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, was also chanted in public worship as far back as the fifth century before Christ. A quote from the Jewish Talmud from the first century of the Christian era reads, he who reads the Pentateuch without tune shows disregard for it and the vital values of its laws. So probably the earliest form of chant was cantillation or raised speech. Cantillation was probably inspired by the practice of raised speech used in large gatherings like this one but without a microphone <coughs> in order to be heard and understood. So if I didn't have a microphone and I sang in order to be heard and understood, you would probably understand me, even though I didn't have a microphone. But uh, we, won't, we won't worry about that right now. Um, then I, I wanted to say that the, um, uh, we may still use this technique sometimes today when we raise our voice for an emphasis. And in the public sector, auctioneers may best exemplify a traditional ritual of raised speech. That was mentioned this morning in Dr. Foley's talk. I, I caught that and I said, wow, we're along the same line there. At the time of Jesus, the cantillation in the public sector was undoubtedly employed by the Roman Senate and with any public pronouncement. I wonder, perhaps, at the trial of Jesus, if the final pronouncement by Pilate to crucify him was even cantillated in raised speech. In the temple or synagogue, Cantillation was relied on both to be heard and in respect for the importance of scripture and traditional writings. When Jesus entered the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We may be reasonably sure that he cantillated these verses of scripture. Much of scripture, particularly the canticles and psalms, were written in couplets, verses composed of two phrases. 
The passage from Isaiah just referred to may be used as an example. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, therefore he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and release to prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God. Cantillation of scripture and psalmody, therefore, is determined by sentence and phrase structure. Though most probably performed extemporaneously in the early stages of development, the natural rising and falling of the voice with the punctuation of the text soon developed into more formal musical cadences. So a simple rising and falling might be, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, therefore he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives. With the Peregrinus tone, which some scholars think is very similar, the Peregrinus tone is one of the oldest tones, psalm tones, in the Liber Usualis, is very similar to a Jewish tone that they found in the uh, Jewish community in Yemen. This is the tone. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, therefore he has anointed me. A little bit ornate. So you can see where, where we went with this. We began with just punctuation, and then we began to elaborate that punctuation into beautiful phrases, beautiful musical phrases. This example de demonstrates the, the simple half cadence then. So at, at a pause in the text, perhaps a comma, perhaps a comma, perhaps a comma, perhaps a comma. You have a simple fall and rise of the voice. And this reflects the natural punctuation of the text. The second half of the couplet has a more complete pause. Perhaps a period, perhaps a period, falling down, the voice the voice naturally drops, is reflected by a drop in the pitch. This example forms the basis of the tone for the prayers used in our present Missal and Sacramentary and the chants in the dialogue of our Mass and psalm tones of the Church. Therefore, from the, the, they form the, what we call the cantillation style, the most basic genre of the Gregorian chant repertoire. However, the Church has passed down to us over the ages not only the cantillating tones, but rich and beautiful chants for the ordinary of the Mass, for the propers of the Mass, hymns, antiphons, and responsories. The Church's repertoire of chant ranges from a simple melody, Pater nos tequias in celi, to extremely florid styles, The mass is ended, go in peace, alleluia, alleluia. On Easter, a little bit more florid. The, so the, the uh, ordinaries and the propers are sometimes uh, more florid than other times. Today we're going to be using Mass 9. And Mass 9 is a little bit more florid than some of the other Masses. So we'll work with that. We pr probably should leave some more time to do that. So let me go on just a little bit. I'm going to skip a little bit down here because I want to um, make sure that we have time for a rehearsal and to prepare ourselves for our liturgy. So I'll skip down to the documents on the liturgy. The documents on the liturgy and sacred music are consistent in upholding Gregorian chant as the church's own music. The preconciliar documents on liturgy and sacred music are um, uh, starting with the beginning of the 20th century, Charles Solici Turini, Pope St. Pius X, 1903, Divini Cultus, Pope Pius XI, 1928, Mediator Dei, 1947, Musicae Sacrae Disciplina, 1955, and De Musica Sacra, 
1958, all during the reign of Pope Pius XII. All uphold Gregorian chant as the supreme model of sacred music, demonstrating as it does the guidelines for sacred music set down in the modo proprio of St. Pius X. It demonstrates these principles of holiness, goodness of form, and universality. Right out of Pius X's modo proprio, which is reiterated in almost all of the documents of the church on sacred music. Almost every one of the documents that I've named, plus the post conciliar documents. Even when referring to the when, even when referring to the importance of the participation of the people, these documents recommend that the people sing Gregorian chant. They also state that Gregorian chant must be cultivated in seminaries and ecclesiastical institutions. But these documents all precede Vatican II. What about post-conciliar documents? The 1963 Constitution on Sacred Liturgy of, uh, from Vatican II, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and the 1967 Instruction on Sacred Music, Musicum Sacrum, and the 2002 General Instruction on the Roman Missal all state that Gregorian chant is distinctive of Roman liturgy and should be given pride of place. Our most recent document from our bishops from the USBCC is in November of, of 2007. It says, regarding Gregorian chant, it reiterates that Gregorian chant is especially suited to the Roman liturgy and should be given pride of place. There is no doubt where the teaching authority of the church stands in reference to Gregorian chant. Certainly other forms and styles are welcome in our liturgy in order to reach people of all ages and all cultures and help them pray. But the Gregorian chant retains a special place for it is the sung prayer that grew and developed with the church's liturgy. At this time, I would like to take some time to have a brief instruction and then we'll have a rehearsal. So I have, um, first of all, a slide showing the solfege syllables. Uh, I think it was Dr. Foley referred to the solmization. Uh, the Guido d'Arezzo began in, in the 10th century. And um, this is it. He, he took this from Ut Que Laxus, Ut Que Ant Laxis, and that's uh, indeed a hymn for um, uh, Vespers uh, for the uh, Feast of St. John the Baptist. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do with this is to show you the different positions of dough. For the three, first three staves, we have three positions for the dough clef. The dough clef is supposed to be a stylized C, so that indicates where dough is. So if you look at the fourth line position and you count down line, space, line, space, and let's sing Do, using that as our Do, and we're gonna go backwards, and Do, top line, third space, T, third line, La, second space, Sol, second line, Fa, first space, me, first line, re, and that brings us to do, good, good. So we, we see where do is when the, when the clef, when the do clef is on the fourth line. When it's on the third line though, let's, let's count down. We're going to start on the third line, that's the second stave, and do the same thing. Do, second space, T, second line, La, first space, So, first line, Ha, and that brings us to the first note there, Mi. Okay, are you with me so far? Let me go back then and say that, that we're starting on the line where that clef is. Do you see that symbol? The, t the first one has a clef on the, on the fourth line, though. The second one has a clef on the third line. The third one has a clef on the second line. So therefore, Do 
is in a different position for each of these clefs. That's my point. Okay? So that, that makes all the other notes different as well. So if, if, going on, let's take a look at the third one. And let's make a lower note do, because this is going to be lower. Do, T. So second line, do, everybody. Do, first space, T. First line, la. And then that space below the staff is so. And indeed, you see, so. Let's sing that scale on the third line together. So, la, ti, do, re, mi, so. Okay? We're getting it. We're getting it. Now, the other two clefs, I don't think I'm going to cover because we're not going to be using them in our rehearsal, and because of lack of time, we won't be using them. But those two clefs tell you where fa is. It's called the fa clef. The principle is the same, but all the music that we're doing today is on do clef, so I'm not going to go there. Let's go to the next sheet and some just different types of notes that you'll run into in Gregorian chant notation. The first line is the punctum, which is simply a, a square note. We call this square note notation sometimes, but in the second line we have diamond notes, don't we? So we have diamond shaped notes in the second line, the, the rhombus, and the virga is like the punctum, only it has a stem. So you see the virga is a, is a, has a stem. So those are the three basic types. The only thing that, that there's going to be uh, one uh, compound neum that is going to maybe throw you a little bit, but for the most part, that's all that we'll have, have to work with. Now I'm going to show you how we have combined those types to make different uh, two-note and three-note neums. Let's go to the next sheet. The podatus, the first one, goes from low to high. Can we sing do on the first example? It's on the fourth line. Do. And then let's go down to the bottom note that we see there. Do, ti, la. Good. So that first note is what? So. Which makes the second note what? So la ti. Notice that it skips the line and goes up to the next space. So ti. And that's how you read it. You read it from low to high, from the bottom to the top note. On the clevis, you read this from the high to the low note. So what would this be? Let's do the same thing, the same exercise. We'll start with do. The clef is on the fourth line. Do. Third space, ti. La. So the first note is what? And the second note is what? You guys are great. You're fast. Wow. And the first note on the, on the climacus, which goes high, low, low, goes right down, starts right on. Do. So let's do the climacus together. And do. You got it. You got it. You got it. Now, uh, this next one is called Escondicus, and I'm going to ask you to think, of, well, no, let's just do it. Do, ti, la, sol, fa. So the bottom note is that little punctum to the left of the podatus. That's the, that's the first note. Fa, and then you go to the bottom note of the podatus, that's sol, la, ti is the top note. Okay? So that's that scandicus. Then the, the torculus, these words are, are uh, you know, are, have a long history behind them. But the words are not the important thing. What's important is how to read it and how to sing it. So we're not going to worry too much about the words, except there, there it is, it's a torculus. And the torculus goes low, high, low. All right? So let's go down from do together. Do, ti, Good, there's your first note. Sing the Torkelus, and... Okay, now we, uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a, a, a bum steer here. The Perectus. This is the one that everybody goes, what's that? So we have this, this, the, you know, this uh, real thick line, and if you could think of... Have, has anybody done calligraphy? 
You know how the pen, if you turn it one way, it is real narrow, and if it goes the other way, it's real fat? Well, they used a, a, a quill back in, in the days of the monks in the, in the medieval times, and so they would, they would go just like that. They would make that narrow stem going up, then they go whoosh, the sideways, and then go up narrow, and then come this way to make the, the, the top note. And so they, they formed these, the bottom two notes with a kind of a swish of the, that wide line. So the, the two notes that that wide line uh, symbolizes are the, the, line, the note on the second space and the note on the second line. So you're going from the second space to the second line. So that would be in the second space. Let's go down from Do. Do. Ti, la, so. So the first note is so. Then the next note is what? Ah. Good. Then the next note is what? La. Some of you got it. Good. So, fa, la. All right. So that gives us a, kind of a, a, a little bit of a, of a start. Anyway, let's go to the psalmus Alleluia. Hallelujahs. I was really happy that I was able to plug into one thing from Dr. Foley. Now I can plug into something that uh, Father Perone said in his talk. Was anybody here for Father Perone's talk? Wasn't that fabulous? So uh, he mentioned about the responsorial psalm, and he said the one form that's never used is the Alleluia psalm from the from the gradually uh, simplex. And when he said that, I go, Oh, I have that in my talk. That's cool. <laughs> that works out nice. So this is the Psalmus Alleluiaricus, or the Alleluia Psalm. And, and what this is, the uh, Father mentioned that uh, for the new rite, you do not have to um, um, have a responsorial, you don't have to have the response that is given in the lectionary. The, the, the general instruction of the Roman Missal allows us to do other things with the responsorial psalm. So during the, uh, the season of Easter, I do this with the seminarians. So this happens to be Psalm 34, but uh, whatever the psalm, the responsorial psalm is for the day, you could use this. So it is, I will bless the Lord at all times. Ah, my pitch is wrong. Let's do, help me out here. Can you get me on pitch? Let's try it. Do. Thank you. Ah. I will bless the Lord at all times. Alleluia. His praise always on my lips. Alleluia. Let's try this. I'll do the I will bless the Lord at all times. You do the Alleluia. I will bless the Lord at all times. Alleluia. His praise always on my lips. Alleluia. Let's try it one more time. And I will bless the Lord at all times. Alleluia. His praise always on my lips. Alleluia. This is nice. This is nice. I have also used this for the communion proper. Uh, uh, going to communion, it's difficult sometimes to know what to do. Uh, you can't bring a book up with you, so you can't sing a hymn. So you always have to have something, e either uh, you find... Uh, organ music, or um, maybe waiting till at the end for, for the hymn, or having a refrain that everybody knows that they can sing. But this works out really nice. And uh, today, for example, our, our um, response, or, I mean, our communion proper is from Psalm 34. So you could use this for today's Mass, for example, and do all the verses of the psalm and go through the whole psalm using uh, the Alleluia psalm uh, format, okay? So that's, uh, that's just an idea uh, for your, you know, to, to think about. Let's go through the, uh, the, the Mass for today. Okay, this is the introit. And what I did here uh, uh, is to take um, the antiphon that is found in the Graduale Romanum, and it's actually this week, it's actually the same as the antiphon found in the Roman Missal, which is not always the case, but this week it is. And the antiphon is, If you, O Lord, laid bare our guilt, who could endure it? But you are forgiving God of Israel. See iniquitates. 
And the psalm that we use with this is Psalm 130. What I did was I, I, I took the, um, what, what I would call sentinization. I, I didn't really compose this, but I constructed it. I constructed it. And I used type melodies from the repertoire of Gregorian chant. So if you, ha if you look in uh, um, uh, the repertoire of Gregorian chant, you will find these snippets, you know, these four little pieces, often in the repertoire of Gregorian chant. They appear often, and we call them type melodies. I took this type, the, these type melodies, these four type melodies, and I, and I tweaked them so that they would work with the English and they would make sense musically uh, within themselves. So this is the chant. Again, help me out with the first pitch. Do, go down. Do. Good. If you, O oh Lord, lay bare our guilt. Let's try it. If you, O oh Lord, lay bare our guilt, who could in you it? But you are forgiving, God of Israel. Let's try that again. If you, oh Lord, lay bare who could in your name? But you are forgiving God is my And in between each one, the, the scholar will sing a verse. Scholar, out of the depths, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord, Lord. If you, O oh Lord, lay bare our guilt, who could in your head? But you are forgiving, God. The responsorial psalm today. Let's let's find the first pitch. The do clef is on the third line. Let's go down to the first line. Give me my pitch. Do. There you are. Fill us with your love, O Lord, and we will sing for joy. Together. Fill us with your love, O Lord, and we will sing for joy. Scola. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain wisdom of Return to the Lord our Lord, and pity on your servant, and fill us with your love, O Lord, and we will sing for joy. Okay? The Alleluia for today is taken right from the Graduale Simplex. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to write it down here. This is from the Graduale Simplex, and there are several Alleluias that are short and easy for a congregation to sing, just like this one. You have a whole repertoire. It's very much a, um, um, neglected. The Graduale Simplex has a wealth of material for us. We need to delve into it. Alleluia, 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 and Alleluia, Alleluia. Yeah, hallelujah again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the offertory antiphon. Remember us, O Lord, you who have all power, put in my mouth persuasive words in the presence of the King. And remember us, O Lord, 
you who have all power, put in my mouth persuasive words in the presence of the King. Let's break that up a little bit. Repeat after me. Remember us, O Lord. Remember us, O Lord. You who have all power, you who have all power, put in my mouth persuasive words, put in my mouth persuasive words, in the presence of the King, in the presence of the King. Sing it all the way through. Remember us, O Lord, you who have all power, put in my mouth persuasive word in the presence of the King. To you who I lift up my soul, O Lord my God, remember us, O Lord, you who have all power, put in my mouth persuasive words in the presence of the King. And the communion antiphon, the last proper. The rich suffer want and go hungry, but nothing shall be lacking for those who serve the Lord. The rich suffer want and go hungry, but nothing shall be lacking for those who serve the Lord. Okay, do we have a Kyrie? There you go. Wow, isn't that scary? All right. Okay, okay. We're going to try something here. I'm going to teach the two eleisons only. I'm going to teach just a little bit of this because we only have two minutes. I would like you to sing eleison. Listen. Eleison. Eleison. Again. Eleison. Scola N. Now the ele son is different on the Christe. Listen. Christe, Christe. Eleison, try that. Eleison, and then Christe, the former one. Eleison, then back. Christe, Eleison, and then Kirihe. Eleison, Kyrie. Eleison, Kyrie. Everyone. I apologize. It would be very uh, wonderful if we had more time. The Agnus Day, we can just learn, we only have time to learn the Miserere Nobis. Miserere Nobis. Try it. Miserere Nobis. Again. And then the second on your stay is the same. Me, 
And the third Agnus Dei is the same melody. Dona nobis? Do. So let's try it. On your host, we Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm so sorry that we didn't have more time. I'd like to just say that, that uh, uh, this may be, there may be parts of this Mass then that while you won't be able to join us in singing, you can join us in listening and make that your prayer and you can still join into the prayer. Active listening is still active participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.